I'm going to show our classification, our simple classification of the carotid and uh, how it's related to the skull bones. I've been doing this talk for a, a decade or, or so, uh, but uh, you must understand that both open as well as endoscopic skull base, the main, the main thing that will limit you from doing more is the carotid. So let's get straight into the carotid. So we just put, put it on Facebook. I'm, I'm actually sharing it from Facebook. So uh, this is what John gets uh, very excited about. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually sharing this from Facebook. So I'm, I'm going to show you the segments of the carotid and then I'll show you how they're related to skull base structures. And I'm going to do it in less than 10 minutes, okay? So you will see that that segment of the carotid, the ENT or the endoscopic surgeon is called parapharyngeal. That segment of the carotid is called the C7 in our classification, C7. Remember that all the odd numbered segments. So for example, C7, C5, C3, all of them are vertical. This is about our classification. If you want to say something, the main thing about our classification is all odd segments are vertical. So starting from proximal, we're going to have C7 where it enters the petrous bone that's vertical. Then we have the paraclinoid carotid, which is again vertical. So odd numbers. So C7, the next is C5. And then you have C3, the paraclinoid or the paracellar carotid, which is again vertical. So then you have C7, C5, C3. You just, you just join these with horizontal segments and you have the entire carotid in the skull base. It's so easy, you see? So you have C6, that's the petrous carotid. You have C4, that is the horizontal intracavernous carotid. And you have C2, which is, which is your intradural carotid. Now, from an endoscopic as well as for a lateral uh, perspective, one important branch that you see here at the C5, C4 junction is the meningohypophyseal branch. Very important for petroclavial tumors, very important for many other things. I mean, we, if we had uh, time, we could have shown you how we can clip this artery between the fourth nerve and the V1 for uh, some time this meningohypophyseal artery can supply a dural AVF. And so in such one of those cases, we have clipped this meningohypophyseal artery between the fourth and the V1. So the fourth and V1, I will show you. I'm gonna show you structures now. What is that ligament? That ligament is the petrolingual ligament where the C6 carotid becomes the C5 carotid. So that's a petrolingual ligament. Okay. So now we have some more landmarks. That is the clivus. That's why it's obviously called the paraclival segment. You have the PCP there, the posterior clinoid process. You have the anterior clinoid process there. By the way, this illustration was done by Voralux, and uh, she's one of the most talented uh, illustrators, uh, and she's a consultant neurosurgeon, so, and interested in vascular and skull, which is one of the most talented uh, illustrators that we've seen. And it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, we have a few of the, them with us right now. 
uh, there's this boy from Africa who's really, really good. And uh, there's one from Moldova who's also uh, doing this. So we need to get this talent and, you know, we need this help to bring information that we have, Louis has, Pragash has to the world to illustrate. This is so important, you know, that's how we can teach. So that's the uh, PCP and the ACP. And so now the nerves are coming into view. So underneath and lateral to the ACP, you have, that is a superior orbital fissure. And you have the third nerve. The fourth nerve will come and actually overtake the third nerve in the superior, superior orbital fissure. That's the third and the fourth nerve. Then you have the V1, V2, V3. And medial to the V1, you have the sixth nerve. And then you have the eustachian tube going parallel uh, parallel to the C6 carotid laterally. The GSPN nerve going there, becoming the VDN nerve, marking the foramen lacerum. The foramen lacerum is where the C6, C5 junction happens. So uh, that is a, a super, I mean, the greater superficial petrosal nerve uh, goes there joins with the LSPN and becomes a VDN now there and it's a marker of the foramen lacera. And you can see the C7 ascends in front of the cochlea. So that's a cochlea there. So when you're doing a, a Kawase's approach, one of the things that if you completely drill away the cochlea is that you can uh, go and enjoy your carotid. As long as you keep your cochlea in a Kawase's approach, um, if you see the cochlea and if you preserve it there's very high chances that you will you will not do this you will not damage the c6 c67 junction of course in agavas the approach you always decorticate and uh, expose the carotid uh, because you can maximize your lateral approaches so all this we will be showing when the petrus portion comes we'll be showing all these videos both cases as well as uh, anatomy videos so you see it's so easy the carotid becomes so easy c7 horizontal segment so the c7 horizontal segment c5 horizontal segment c6 horizontal segment i mean sorry c3 c5 and c7 odd numbers they are I mean, sorry, vertical segments. And then you have the C6 and the C4 horizontal segments. And you have all the structures that are around the carotid in the skull base. And that is anterolateral skull base for you. Now, let us see if you can recognize some of these structures. Let's see. Okay. Let's, so what is that segment? That is the C7 segment. That is your C6 segment. That is your C5. That's your infralateral trunk between the fifth and the V1, I mean V1 and the sixth nerve. That's the infralateral segment. That's the infralateral trunk. Very important sometimes in sphenopetroclival meningiomas. That's a meningohypophyseal trunk. That's a horizontal intracavernous segment. You have the C3, you have the C2, there are three fourth nerves there, V1, V2, V3. You have your GSP in there, you have semicircular canals and the cochlea there. Right. So let's see another picture. Now this looks very complicated right now, very complicated right now, but let's try and identify. So that is your optic now, that's your optic now there. So you have your ophthalmic artery there, and then you have your distal dural ring there, and you have your proximal dural ring there. That is C3, that is C5, and that is C6. This is the C7, the C7, C6 junction. And as we said, the cochlea, this is the cochlea right behind it. That's the cochlea. That is V3, V2, V1. And then you have 
What is that now? Third and the fourth now. And that is the, what ligament is that? The petroclinoidal ligament or the Gruber's ligament. So that is the sixth nerve. That is the sixth nerve coming through the Dorolus canal, coming medial to V1. It's sometimes very important to remove this uh, ligament and drill this bone in uh, petroclival tumors. And uh, uh, you will see the, the C5 segment and medial to that, you will, medial to the, this region of the gazillion ganglion, you will have the, I mean, you have the petrolingual ligament. Between V1 and V2, you can see the sphenoid sinus there. And then you can see this nerve running on the C6, that's a GSPN nerve. And at this point, between the V2 and V3, you can see the VDN nerve there. If you drill between the V2 and the V3, you're going to see the VDN nerve there. So you see this such a complex picture becomes so easy for you. You come to the posterior fossa, you're going to see the seventh and eighth, the eighth complex. You're seeing the GSPN nerve, the LSPN there, uh, and you can see the semicircular canals posteriorly. And so you can see the entire cause of the seventh nerve there, except the mastoid segment. So the middle ear, the middle ear is also open, open here. So you can see the entire carotid. That's the C6 carotid horizontal, C5 vertical. C3 vertical and C2 there. Right. So excellent. So let's get into one more picture. Now I'm going to show you a case. You should know a little bit about the carotid here. Is exactly what I want you to uh, see. So supposing you do an anterolateral skull base approach. Yes. So I'm going to show you a paraclinoidal aneurysm and you should see that once you take off this temporal lobe away, once you take off this temporal lobe away, what you're seeing is the cavernous sinus here. The cavernous sinus, you can see the third, fourth, V1 going into the superior orbital fissure. You have done an axial unlocking. When you've done an axial unlocking, what you're seeing is a cavernous sinus. This is a transcavernous approach. You'll see the V2 there. And once you've taken away this temporal lobe laterally, you got, you got a lot of uh, space there and you take off this clinoid and take off this optic roof, you get much, much more space there. So whether it's to deal with craniopharyngiomas, whether it's to deal with uh, uh, meningiomas, whether it is to deal with aneurysms of the paraclinoid region, which of which one we're going to show you right now. And that'll be one single case that we will show you and uh, so that'll be you you should remember the classification of the carotid and this approach this approach is one of the most common approaches that every neurosurgeon does just an extension of that approach so you can see the proximal dural ring which is actually the roof of the cavernous sinus and the distal dural ring which needs to be incised in many cases so let's go ahead and let's see this case. So it's a paraclinoidal aneurysm, it's a transitional aneurysm. So we, we're going to, you can see that's a frontal lobe, that's a temporal lobe. You're going to cut the orbital meningeal band and start a sharp dissection there, usually with the, I like the diamond knife. It's very light on your hand. I've seen Louis using the 11 blade knife, which is another 
uh, good thing that I love. I mean, it's really sharp, very, very sharp, and you can use new ones each time. So that's a dissection that I use to uh, preserve the true cavernous membrane and take away the temporal lobe away from the cavernous sinus, thereby doing an axial unlocking. I do my uh, basilatic aneurysms like this. We will be talking on the transcavernous approach to the basilar uh, uh, very soon in the WFNS anatomy meeting. So it's the same approach. So I'm what I'm doing is this is a front, this is a frontal lobe, this is a frontal lobe, this is a temporal lobe. Frontal lobe here, temporal lobe here. When you are doing this dissection, what you are doing is you are opening up between the frontal and the temporal. And when you are opening the jewel that you find in the opening that with that is going to obstruct all your approaches is the anterior clinoid processes, process and the optic root. When you remove that jewel, see that is a jewel. Okay, that's your cavernous sinus going into the superior orbital fissure. So that is your that is your clinoid process. So before taking off the clinoid process, you're going to dissect your temporal lobe away from the cavernous sinus as much as you need. You don't need to go posteriorly to the Kawase's triangle. This is not a petroclavial meningioma. So there's no need for that. But you use this dissection plane. There will be no bleeding at all. You don't need to inject anything. You don't need to... If you use... If you keep the, the right plane, there's not going to be bleeding. As Louis says, it's peeling, uh, like the ladies do. Louis always says feeling. You know, Louis is a ladies' man, so he keeps saying all these uh, uh, things about feeling, and he knows it very well. So, you know, people ask me what, what do I drill? Where is the optic strut, and uh, where is the anterior clinoid process limit, and all that? Uh, my thing is, uh, I drill all the bone that I see there. Whatever gives me access, I drill all the bone. So I don't really worry about. Where is the strut? Where is the anterior clinoid process ending? So I drill all the bone there. So in that region, this is the anterolateral corridor. And I drill everything. The optic nerve is there. I know that the optic nerve is there. I don't want to get into shallow, I mean, uh, I mean deep wells. So I make everything shallow. For that, you should take out, you should take out all this bone. That's the optic nerve. So you can see that the optic nerve is there. That's a clinoid process, that, that the cavernous sinus is there. So you are drilling out this bone right now. So you must understand that the aneurysm is right there. The aneurysm is in touch, it's a ruptured aneurysm, and it is touching the clinoid process. The only thing that will separate you from uh, that is the dura. So you must not uh, go past the dura. I mean, unless you want a rupture when you are in the extradural plane. So I have removed everything except uh, a, a shell of bone and I'm still uh, slowly dissecting further so that I have the entire anterior clinoid process to me to dissect. I mean, now we are using the two millimeter drill diamond to shave off the clinoid completely away from the dura and underneath the dura is our ruptured aneurysm. So the strut will be always between the optic nerve and the carotid. So the strut is between the optic nerve and the carotid. So and the carotid, lateral to carotid, here is the aneurysm. So we are going to drill off all that carotid. I mean, sorry, drill off all that uh, anterior clinoid process, exhaling it completely, knowing very well that the aneurysm is right there. But believe me, we do all our paraclinoids like this. And uh, if you respect that dura, and if you don't make forceful movements, I mean, if you use the drill like a paintbrush, okay? I mean, I have seen the masters, you, Ha, Louis, Vlad, all these guys, they use, they use no force, you know. They don't probably work out in the gym. So, but 
they use absolutely no force okay so you can see that the drill behaves like a paintbrush now you can see the optic now completely exposed you can see the struts bone of the strut there and you can see the clinoid process there so i am you know for a neurosurgeon feel is important it's just not seeing you know you have to feel it it's very important to feel it so that's the optic nerve that's the optic nerve and that's the strut there so you have to remove the strut it's very important very important so now you cannot uh, uh, you can just use the two millimeter only for some more time because you are seeing the dura and the aneurysm is there so people can help me and tell me that the segment of the carotid down there is c3 there's a cavernous carotid going down there it's becoming c2 there proximal and the distal dural ring is going to be in this region okay now i'm using a one millimeter drill okay because the two millimeter drill is too big now so i'm using a one millimeter drill again using it like a, a paintbrush and you must understand that the one millimeter drill actually is like a needle it's just like a needle it can easily go in if you use any force or something you see my suction is so big okay but so it's a one millimeter drill is like a needle if it if it goes inside and touches that aneurysm uh, we are going to stay for a long time with this case okay and patient is also probably going to stay a long time in the hospital so we don't want to do that so again you see that the that bone is moving so we are very very gentle on that under very high magnification so that entire strut that bone everything what i see there right from the optic nerve to the anterior clinoid process everything is gone so keep on uh, thinning it out thinning it out feel it and again if there is a bone use that one millimeter and gently shave it off this is a strategy and now you are seeing the dura there the dura of the optic nerve the optic strut is uh, removed there that's op that's optic nerve and that's a carotid when you can see that junction you you have done enough good good optic strut removal there is a little bit more flattening that you need to do and you are good so this aneurysm has displaced the carotid medially it is a large aneurysm and it's a, it's a transitional aneurysm and so that is the aneurysm you will see now as soon as i open the dura you will see that so the optic strut is being the last bits of optic strut is being removed again thin out and then just breaking it very gently because knowing that that's aneurysm you will see now you open the dura open the dura and right there is an aneurysm so that's optic nerve we have exposed the optic nerve you see on that side the he was talking about the limbus so you see that's uh, that is the that's the fold of dura you see and you see that's a falciform ligament and that is aneurysm that is aneurysm if we had not done the clinoid resection it's a space we would have been really pressed for space but now we have so much of space you see and so that is your optic nerve and now you dissect your any dissect your arachnoid and you are right on to the aneurysm so you dissect all that go to the opposite side because it's ruptured aneurysm now i'm using i'm using a diamond knife to cut the falciform ligament all the way 
to the cavernous roof. Laterally, I'm coming laterally. I'm going straight first and then coming laterally. I'm using the, the ball hook to take this and then I'll cut the distal dural ring, which is literally attached to this aneurysm. So I can take this opening a little bit more I, as, as long as I want, gives you a lot of space because there is no clinoid there. There is no optic strut there. This is the beauty of skull base work. So I have seen Yuha clipping this without any skull base work. Believe me, I mean, I have seen him doing this. I don't know how he does this, but uh, you probably must stay a few years with him to see how he does this. This is a, uh, it's not reproducible, but believe me, this is reproducible. Okay, you can see everything now. All the, this is the, your optic now. And then you will see the aneurysm. I mean, this you'll see the carotid there. And I'm just going to put, I mean, I'm put a bayonet and show my boys how I intend to clip the aneurysm. The carotid is running parallel here. Okay. And that's the aneurysm projecting laterally. So I am just showing them the carotid. I could have taken a little bit more of this. I usually do generally, but here I was com completely, I know where well, that's a carotid. There is a carotid. That's a C3 carotid. That's a proximal dural ring there. You cut that, you will get into the cavernous sinus. Sometimes you have to do that. There will be a lot of unnecessary bleeding. And uh, so you can see the carotid there. The carotid is there. You can see the carotid. And that is a aneurysm, beautifully seen. You can see the swirl of blood within this aneurysm. I am looking for the rupture point. Uh, cannot for that's a that's a that's a carotid there. That's a carotid. You can see, and that's the aneurysm. You must uh, not rush. Um, the more you rush. Uh, the more of less of a neurosurgeon and more of a, I mean, I wouldn't say orthopedic or general surgeon because uh, that will be distress, disrespecting them. So I would say the more you rush, the less of a surgeon you will become. Okay? Patience is, uh, is a big thing. Uh, that doesn't mean that you're going to sit and go out there for uh, ages and, uh, you know, irritate everybody from anesthetist to yourself. So that's the carotid beautifully seen, the C3 carotid becoming the C2 carotid. You can see the vertical carotid there and the horizontal carotid and the aneurysm split. There is a neck still remaining. And I don't have those micro clips. So I put a macro clip like a micro clip. I, I just, uh, yes, that is the neck taken. You can see the C3 carotid. That is the, that is a C2 carotid and we are done. So I need to broadcast and uh, um, I'm going to ask uh, guys to ask questions. There are panelists here. So Vlad, Ibrahim, um, Vinod, Prakash, uh, Yuha. Yuha, is he around? No, I think is he Yuha just left. No, no, he just left. Yeah, it must be crazy time for him. It must be some time, something like midnight for him. So, yes, um, people can please uh, comment. And uh, also, if there is a, this is a consensus. So, this is a, we can, we can have a good discussion. Please. No, actually, these were one of the topmost presentations which I recently heard. And what I would like to ask is, see, we have two set of surgeons. One is Dr. Pragash which is probably the best in endoscopy, and uh, Louis and you are the best in open approach. So what do you expect the upcoming budding neurosin to be? You want them to be like you or like Prakash? Because see, it is very difficult for a surgeon to be 
100 percent to good in endoscopy and open as well. That is virtually impossible. You cannot be like Pragash and Bob and you. That's impossible. So, what do you expect the upcoming neurosense to be? Uh, well, Louis will uh, also answer this question. But in my uh, in my view, I don't believe in doing both because if it, I mean, I always believe in narrow and deep rather than wide and shallow wide and shallow you can do everything okay you can say i uh, remove rectal polyps and i also remove uh, some superficial brain tumors this is good but if you want to get into skull base open skull base you have to you 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 have to really put in a lot of efforts uh, maybe decade of decade one decade at least into skull base and uh, that you have to be in a good center where you have a lot of cases. It's the only way of uh, doing things. Don't ever think that these understandings and everything will come in a day. I mean, even in this era of internet and information, everything, hand getting your hand steady is something different. So, Pragash's skill is completely different from my skill. So, what I will do is to have Pragash with me rather than trying to learn what Pragash is doing. Or I will try to have Vinod Felix or uh, Narayan Janaki Ram with me if I want endoscopic. I am not going to. Um, I'm not going to do uh, both together. So of course uh, I do endoscopy also, but um, I mean I. It is. It is not my forte. I would rather. I am a guy who will think open. Always I'll think open. If it's cavernous sinus, I'll think open. If it's uh, anything else, I'll think open. And I know I can do open. So. Prakash or Narayan can knows that they can do endoscopic. So, uh, budding neurosurgeons, I would tell tell you guys, depending on what view you like. If you like the view from the nose, go from there. Do everything like Paul or uh, Tetschwaj or uh, Vinod or uh, Prakash. Do everything from there. If you like the view from inside the brain, do everything from there. If you want, if you have a fantastic ENT surgeon, um, ENT surgeon with you, this is the greatest boon you have. Don't try to do everything yourself. This is what my message to you is. Um, I would like to hear Louis' uh, version. If you, Louis, would like to learn some endoscopy in this time and uh, do something like uh, Prakash or Paul or something, or Louis would be happy doing. Uh, legendary work that he does in uh, open i'm learning i'm still learning i, I will be learning forever i believe <laughs> is <laughs> is the way to go i think the skull based surgeon should know endoscopy should know open of course in the future you have some balance the endoscopic surgery change a lot the skull base this partnership with ENT is crucial, crucial. Because you can do endoscopy by yourself, but when you do with the ENT, it's completely different. The way that they see, the way that they hold the, the, the endoscope, the way they prepare is completely different when you do by yourself with the neurosurgeon. I think this partnership for endonasal surgery is, is, is very, very important. But I believe that in the future, not so long, now is already going to get the balance. Which, which case should do endonasal? Which case should do open? What's better to do endonasal? What's better to do? For example, pituitary adenoma today, it's very hair you open the head, very hair. You have several craniopharyngioma that you can remove from the nose. Depend of the size, depend of the extension, depend of everything. See, if you go to the nose to try to, to remove an area that is more dangerous than to come from up, come from up. If you are going to up to try to remove the tumor that's coming out to the nose, it's crazy. You need this balance in everything. Balance is the most important thing. And learn, 
learn all these cowboys approaches. I do by myself the temporal bone. I learn to do the, the petrosectomy. But if you have a nice CNT, you want to work together, do the petrosectomy, it's great. You save your time to the microsurgery. See? But they need to have the same thinking, the same way to thinking in the best for the patient, not the approach that I know, the approach that the patient need. This is the most important thing, the most important thing. Together, but open mind, not looking like this. Yeah. Open mind. You see, sometimes through here, sometimes through here, sometimes through here, sometimes through here. Sometimes you don't need surgery. For example, uh, meningioma of the cavernous sinus today that is more located in the cavernous sinus. We know today that the natural history sometimes is, is, is better than to do anything. See, to understand the pathology, to understand the disease, to understand the best way to treat it is sometimes you need radio surgery. Sometimes you need embolization. See, in life, in medicine, open mind is the best thing that you can get. It's the way they think. <laughs> yeah. per yes. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Uh, Professor Luis Barba, can I ask you one question? See, if you have very large meningium and olfactory fossa, there are some neurosurgeons who advocate doing it endoscopic and the debulking the tumor. So the edema on the brain decreases and that makes, that makes your open surgery far easier. I don't know if you got my point. If you debug the tumor endoscopically, yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> the brain edema decreases and there's a better plane to dissect during the open approach. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You can come from, from the cranium. It's different to do the surgery when you open the cranium, put one spatula here, one spatula there to see the tumor. But what if it's there is a lot of tumor edema? Yeah, you are coming from below. You kill the tumor, you cut the vascularization. See, the edema is venous edema. What I'm seeing, the people is coming from below, does this decompress? I don't remember to see some case that the edema totally disappear. And the plane will be difficult. In. Yesterday, I did a very large olfactory group meningioma. Very large olfactory group. The edema was there. But the, vet, the problem was not the edema by itself. The problem was some vessel was inside the tumor. See? I think yeah, if you can go some, down, some, yes, some. you go down and cut the vascularization of the tumor. Other trick for olfactory group meningioma that the patient, there is no bone, severe bone invasion. I go intradural and cut the vascularization intradural. If you go extradural, bleed a lot. See? But it's just the same. I cut the vascularization and just work in the tumor without spatula, without, leave the brain alone. I don't, I, I don't understand this. I never saw a post-op MRI from the nose. If you had, you show me, please. <laughs> A post-op MRI that you decompress from the nose, the tumor is still there, and the edema disappears. If the edema disappears, it's good. I never saw it. Maybe, maybe it's a good idea. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, Prakash, uh, there's, a one, there's one question to Prakash. See, Prakash, if you did, I have seen that in the, in the epidermal tumors, when you do that epidermal through the nose, there's a more chance of getting meningitis than when you do it open. Is that so or what do you believe? Because there are some surgeons who completely stop doing epidermal through the nose. In this particular case that I had presented, the CSF which I had done at both times was actually spherile. It did not grow anything, but we had symptoms of meningitis, which was probably chemical meningitis. Mm. Technically, when we look at the clinical scenario, 
uh, it doesn't seem as if um, the epidermoid itself would be very different from uh, craniopharyngioma as far as the surgical section cavity or the behavior to the uh, to the field goes i do not think that epidermoids have uh, any different uh, difference in terms of behavior following an invasive procedure however i would like to add one more thing uh, in this particular case the epidermoid had a very peculiar location which was the interpeduncular cistern and that was the reason for choosing uh, the endoscopic corridor if it were an, an epidermoid of the interhemispheric fissure or uh, a case where the skull base is entirely intact i would probably have done it through a different corridor probably through a transcranial corridor so um, i am not very certain about whether epidermoids have a greater preponderance to meningitis uh, and i personally feel that the choice of the corridor must be uh, dictated by the anatomical location and the nature of the tumor rather than a didactic uh, a dogmatic uh, technique based uh, decision Thank you. Uh, well, there are some questions uh, from the delegates. Are the panelists okay to take the questions? Hello. Dr. Nahari, you have a question? Yeah, there are yeah, some yeah, questions. Yeah. There are some questions from the yeah. panelists. Uh, no, from the delegates, may I read them out? The first yes, question yes. is actually uh, pituitary adenoma with supracellular extension with an hourglass deformity with an anterior and retrocellular extension. Do you still feel endoscopic is the best approach? There is a question from Dr. Harshad Parikh. Maybe Prakash should answer it. Prakash? So, uh, see, the uh, pituitary adenoma is essentially an extra arachnoidal tumor. It lies within the dura of the cella, but it is essentially extra arachnoidal. So, uh, we'll first take a scenario where the tumor is extra arachnoidal completely without any breach of the diaphragma in the sense that there are no nubbins or there are no extensions beyond the smooth uh, surface of the diaphragma. In those cases, the endonasal corridor continues to be a very good approach. The exposure needs to be wide. And in our case, we expose very widely. We go from uh, cavernous sinus to cavernous sinus. We unroof the entire cella, and we take off the bone over the uh, uh, tuberculum if, re if required. And uh, the exposure always helps us get the extension of the tumor on the lateral aspect. So we can dissect the tumor off the diaphragma. We can come to the edge of the uh, diaphragma, and then further take our take the uh, surgical procedure on to the uh, part of the tumor which is suppressed. The second well, well is, Prakash, when do, when do you say that this tumor is not ideal for an endoscopic approach? When do you say this pituitary adenoma is not good for an endoscopic? What are the scenarios? Laterally, into the, uh, cavern, into the sylvan fissure. So those are tumors that are not accessible through the endonasal corridor. And whenever we've had those scenarios where we've had large tumors within the uh, sylvian fissure, uh, we definitely prefer to come in from the uh, uh, terional transylvian uh, corridor first and then deal with whatever is left behind in a second setting uh, later on. But for tumors which essentially respect the midline uh, and either extend into the ventricle or even into the subarachnoid space, so we have a set of tumors which are intraarachnoid and they violate the diaphragma, they violate the arachnoid and are located in the intra-arachnoidal, subarachnoidal space. So they come in direct contact with neurovascular structures. They come in direct contact with the carotid artery, uh, the oculomotor nerve and the chiasm. And even in those cases, they can be treated in the same manner that we manage craniofarynomas by going extra-arachnoidal, opening the diaphragma, opening the dura of the tuberculum and coming anteriorly. But uh, in those cases, the dissection of the tumor from the perforators and from the main vessels must be very meticulous. And those are also patients who might have a greater incidence of having visual decline following surgery. But for patients who have lateral extension of the cavernous sinus, definitely they are not very good candidates for the endonasal corridor. They probably would do better from a transnasal corridor. The okay. second situation is patients who have tumors extending into the parapedicular space. So cavernous sinus tumors 
but go through the pedal motor triangle and go into the parapedicular space on the lateral aspect of the midbrain. Uh, there are techniques described for approaching them through the endonasal corridor, but they lie, uh, they have a high risk of third nerve cancer. Those tumors also probably are better approached through a transcranial. Okay, um, coming to the next, thank you, Prakash. Coming to the next question. Um, uh, this is a question from Dr. Pablo Villanau. Talking about aneurysms, what is your opinion about going for endovascular so for some particular anatomic ana regions? Maybe it's to Dr. Aipcharian. When do you want to offer an endovascular option in aneurysm? Uh, well, uh, in my case, almost never. Uh, because uh, I think we can handle at this stage of uh, my career, uh, I think I am okay handling um, aneurysms in an open way. Of course, there are difficult aneurysms, there are extremely difficult aneurysms, there are aneurysms which are almost impossible to do. But with a bypass, uh, you should be able to handle most of these aneurysms. Now, um, I mean, if anybody is trained, so for example, Shabarish is dual trained, so he would go for a basilar um, in a, you know, in a, he would not operate on a basilar, maybe he would go for an endovascular approach. So it depends on people and depends on the facilities. Right now, for the last 13 years, I've been working in a place where there was no endovascular facility at all. And uh, for me, I would always run on the mill aneurysms, um, paraclinoid, basilar, uh, anything, I would not go uh, endovascular. I would rather be very happy flipping them uh, open. Um, I have can I comment on that. Um, uh, I think I think it is. Yeah, yeah, please. I think it is important to be able to do every aneurysm open and endovascular, either you or you and your partner, um, and uh, select what you have to do for your patient. There are some cases where it's better done endovascular, it's better done open, but then if it can be done by both ways. I think it's important to give the patient the choice and tell them what is the advantages and disadvantages of each and let them choose what they want for themselves. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, basilar to aneurysms, I would say, you know, I always tell the patients we can do an open operation, we can do an endoscopic, we can do it endovascular. I tell them, frankly, you know, clip is one and done, there's no chance of any recurrence. It comes with some comorbidities, like cranial comorbidities, but they recover, right? But on the other hand, if you do it endovascular, there's a chance of the aneurysm coming back. You need to be on aspirin, Plavix. You need retreatments. You need to come back again and again to check the aneurysm. So it's really what the patients want. And you should be able to do uh, both well if they choose to do either. Uh, well, uh, Shabari sir, it's actually very nice to see you after the college. He's my senior in Madhuri Medical College. Thank nice you. to see you, sir. May I say something? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's a hi to Dr. Shabari. He's my senior in medical college. So it's hi to him. So, uh, and there is the next question is, when do you do a simultaneous approach, both open and endoscopic together? There is a question by one other delegate. Can somebody take no, the Lewis question? Wants to say, Lewis wants oh, to say sorry, 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 Luis, yeah. Okay, about the pituitary adenoma, I always start from the nose. I always start from the nose. Because the great majority of the time is, is midline, okay? And sometimes go high. In the transnasal for pituitary, you never know how much you can remove. Sometimes you go there and believe that you can take everything, you cannot. Sometimes there is area that you believe that you cannot reach, you can. You follow the tumor. Sometimes the tumor, the great majority of the time, the tumor gives you the route. You can follow the tumor. But when the tumor is too lateral, lateral to the ICA in the cavernous sinus, or going out to the uh, oculomotor triangle, Maybe it's not so safe to come from the nose, but 
who, who say that it's possible, it's not possible, is the time. The Twitter is different. For cranial pharyngiomas, if there is a large cella, I start from the nose always and try to remove the maximum that I can. Sometimes you have to come from the nose. You cannot remove. You come from the head. I did a case last, last month that I came from the nose. I removed, but not too much. I came back from, from up. In the same operation time, my partner came from the nose to put back the 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 fascia, the the fascia, no, the the, the nasoceptal flap. See, nose, head, nose, head and nose in the same time to hold the flap. is is important to understand that you need to have all the armamentarium in your in, in your hands and decide case by case. This uh, water that is closed, how you saw, call the, the, looks like you cannot remove the superior part, you see? Sometimes you find a hole in the tumor can. It's case by case you need to decide. The other thing about endovascular, the bone endovascular is here to stay. There are cases that they can do very well, and they, can, they, they cannot do very well. You cannot happen as you go fighting against endovascular for some case. Sometimes you need endovascular, sometimes you don't need. It's the great majority of the time, the best treatment is to clip and done. But if there is some situation that you cannot. See? Everything in life is ballasted. <laughs> Louis, okay. one more thing, you know, I think it's important for neurosurgeons to do endovascular. It's extremely important because if you think about it, if an interventional person who doesn't clip does an angiogram on an aneurysm, they are going to try to treat it by whatever method they can, okay? And they're not going to refer the patient to a neurosurgeon saying that this is better for a clip. So if we have to preserve um, the skill set among neurosurgeons, it's extremely important that neurosurgeons learn angiography and are able to treat these aneurysms. And we do a, a balanced decision and are not biased to one or the other so that we do the best thing for the patients. It's the most important, you know, in, in, in Brazil, I think in the whole Latin America, 70 to 80% of the endovascular, neuroendovascular are made by neurosurgeons. And is growing very, very fast, see? But the radio surgery, 70%, or more are made by radiation therapies, not by neurosurgeon, not, not participate. In this field, you, you need to, to be on also in the radio surgery business. I think it's a neurosurgical business, endovascular is neurosurgical business. You have to be involved in these two subspecialities. And, and, and it's also important to be not biased because there are microsurgeons who go and learn endovascular who still prefer to do an, a microsurgery. There are neurosurgeons who just do endovascular training, do not do complex vascular or skull-based training, and they just treat everything endovascular. It's, it's important to have the expertise to do both equally and do it well, uh, rather than be biased towards one or the other. But this is the most difficult one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, I well, you I there. Don't... Are you there, right? Or Vernad, go ahead. Go ahead. I am, I am, I am here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I will hear. I am actually I was listening to all these excellent comments and what do you call? These are pieces of gold. 
words of wisdom. <laughs> I have, so, I have uh, Prakash. Um, have you tried doing superior hypophyseal aneurysms through the nose? You know, you're able to dissect so well the superior hypophyseal arteries. Maybe you can get proximal control. Uh, is that something that is in the horizon? Is that something that is doable? Why don't more people do that? Uh, so, you know, there's, there is some recent literature with uh, approaches for either the paraclinoid IC aneurysms or for the superior hypophyseal aneurysms. And uh, there are three important things that I think are, uh, step, uh, you know, roadblocks. The first thing is that you need adequate instrumentation. You need the long shafted uh, clip applicators and you can't use the routine uh, clips that have horizontal blades. You need the side biting clips to actually clip these aneurysms. They have, you, you have your conventional uh, clip that opens wide and then closes. You're uh, never be able to get around the aneurysm. So most of the people who do use clips use these side biting clips. So they are not done by. You need the shafted applicators. And uh, the second thing is that uh, you, you have to skeletonize the paraclival carotid artery and then open the cavernous sinus dura to first achieve proximal control. The, uh, so these are limitations from the surgical perspective. Personally, uh, you know, my, the focus of my work, the bulk of my work is essentially skull based surgery, both open and endo and, uh, 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 I'm I have a very small uh, role in overall scheme of um, managing any museums that I have. So, I mean, it's technically feasible. But uh, you need a person who has a focus in that area to go out and do it. But these limitations have to be overcome before somebody decides to start doing it. Have a comment. Can I share this? Yes, yes. 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 Uh, thank you for uh, your uh, nice presentation, Professor uh, Yip and uh, Professor Borba. Uh, and uh, I uh, really, I was uh, very uh, surprised by such a discussion between the two theories of the microneural surgery with the minimal invasive. Actually, there is a main point what I feel it during my practice that the, when you uh, use the endonasal uh, approach, for minimal invasive, you see uh, the pathology. But when you use uh, the micro neurosurgery, you see and control. And that to control is very important in, uh, in, 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 in the uh, risks uh, of the operations. Uh, we can take off the tumor from down, but the, the, the operation actually, it's not just taking the tumor. We are opening the cisterns, we are dissecting the arachnoids. Uh, in the subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage, we are treating the uh, vascular spasm. This cannot be done from below. So this is the philosophy of microneurosurgery. Uh, when you open the Sylvian fissure and you, you see the vessels of the uh, circular uh, of Willis, you control it before you take the tumor out. But when you are working from down, you are taking the tumor, and then after that, you will see the normal structure let's make and this will put this structure in high risk uh, i cannot imagine that if you have a tear in the carotid from how, how you how can how, and how risky you can repair it from uh, uh, down it will be very uh, dangerous for the the patient so the main point that you can see from below but the the micro neurosurgery and the health of the patient you should see and control what you see this is a philosophy, when we're opening the cistern and we're relaxing the, bra the brain, we are treating with the, with the pathology, we are relaxing the brain, we are uh, giving uh, positive uh, uh, points to the, to, the, to the brain and the, to the patients, and this cannot be done from below. So this is uh, uh, what I want to say for you. Thank you very much. I think I want to uh, respond to that particular part. So there are three things that you mentioned. The first is about being able to take control of vasculature. 
So one of the basic concepts of the endonasal corridor is that you encounter the tumor first, rather than having to dissect through structures to come to the tumor. Now, one of the uh, causes for morbidity when you come from the transcranial corridor is that you dissect across the corridor of nerves. For example, when you come into the interpeduncular system, you dissect across the third nerve. And some of these approaches do lend to a certain degree of third nerve balancing. Or if you dissect the sylvian fissure, you have to go through a certain degree of uh, veins, which may also be morbidity. So obviously, the outcomes change from uh, hand to hand and from case to case. But it is not a scenario where the other corridor does not have problems. And it is not a case where uh, the endonasal corridor ha only has problems. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that early decompression of the tumor, early dissection and decompression of the tumor actually facilitates uh, dissection of structures that are related to the wall of the tumor. Because the tumor itself has now collapsed and the arachnoid planes are more prominent and they can be separated very gently. So same thing. the third thing is that in terms of releasing CSF, uh, CSF spaces are open when we open the supracellular cistern or uh, the interpeduncular cistern for endonasal procedures. So contribute to a certain degree of brain relaxation. But uh, for patients who have, say, have hydrocephalus, for instance, the case I presented, you always have the option of inserting an EVD at the beginning of the procedure. The EVD can be retained for three to four days and you can remove them either electively or if you cannot resolve hydrocephalus, you might need to manage the patient with a VP shunt. That again is not dictated by the approach, but by the uh, manner in which the CSS spaces respond to the pre-existing hydrocephalus. So uh, I think uh, it, the, the choice of your corridor is dictated by the lie of the tumor, by the pathology, and also by the technical expertise that one has in dealing with these, rather than being very dogmatic about choosing one corridor over the other. Well, uh, Dr. Borba, Dr. Ibe, you have something to comment on this? Uh, Borba? I don't know. I, I agree with, with Jalal. <laughs> I agree with Dr. Jalal. I think it's, you can dissect from the nose. You can do nice dissection. But it's not the same that microsurgery, short instruments, dissect the insulin. I think your hands are not so stable. Maybe you are, sometimes you take too much risk that you don't need. It's, it's my opinion. <laughs> what about, you, what about you the, can go the through the crana. <laughs> You agree, Dr. Aip, or you have some different opinion? Uh, well, I agree. I mean, I, I think what uh, exactly what Luis uh, uh, said. I mean, obviously, I have done both. I have done endoscopic as well as uh, open uh, microneal surgery. And uh, definitely, definitely, I am not going to go into uh, aneurysms for endoscopic because it's a narrow corridor. Uh, your hands, uh, you know, it's probably because we are not used to it actually. That's why I said uh, the skill sets are different. So maybe, I mean, when I complain, it's it's not true that maybe a guy like uh, Juan or uh, Ted Schwartz or uh, somebody like uh, Paul, they may find it much more easier. But for me, in that narrow corridor dissection with long instruments is always difficult because I'm, I'm not very good at that. So for me, always open uh, with short instruments as uh, what uh, Louis said, I, I completely agree. Okay, so uh, if there is no other comments from uh, any delegates, would each of you like to give one last closing comment? Can I probably start from Dr. Pragash? Last closing comment from you. So uh, I think uh, I say the same thing that I started started by saying in the beginning, and that is that I almost completely agree with Dr. Lewis and uh, Dr. Dalal, and that uh, neurosurgery neurosurgery is a 
is a is a matter of a lot, large number of techniques, and uh, the endonasal technique is just one technique in the armamentarium of the neurosurgeon. Uh, this this is complementary to the uh, transcranial microsurgical technique because not uh, doesn't contradict the transcranial technique. Instead, it's complementary, and uh, the surgeon should uh, be well versed in both to be able to choose the right corridor as dictated by the uh, anatomy of the tumor, the anatomy of the neurovascular structures, and the pathology. Thank you, Thank you Prakash. Uh, any closing remarks and last comments from Professor Borba? I would like to thank you for the, the time. It was very nice, very friendly dissection. I really enjoy and learn a lot with all of you. IP cheering our mentor, a great man, Professor Prakashi, in wonderful presentations. See you next week. Next week it could be Caverno Sinus. Eh? Yeah, yeah, it's Caverno yes, Sinus. Yeah. It'll be a big fight in the cabinet. It'll, <laughs> it'll be okay. It'll be okay. No problem. No problem. <laughs> okay. Thank you very, very much. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Borba. Uh, thank you, Prakash. And I, sir, please give your last closing remarks and and uh, what about, we need to get the closing remark from Dr. John also, yeah. John Bennett. The neurosurgery is changing. So the microscope will soon be replaced. We are working um, very hard on that. Not only will the microscope uh, replace, the navigation and the microscope will become one. And the exoscope will be integrated with that. This is what we are working on. Okay. An exoscope, endoscope, and with navigation. So virtual vision, real vision, and endoscopy together. This is what we are working on. And we call it the hyperscope. The, the chapter is out. The prototype is, uh, we're trying to get it ready in India because uh, every time we're trying to get it outside, the costs are just skyrocketing. So we're trying to get it that This is why I'm leaving my job and coming to India. So things are going to change. Okay, New tools are coming. So you don't have a... Uh, you, you will not have single instruments like a suction. You will have suction with bipolar. Suction with irrigation and bipolar. Maybe uh, maybe uh, CUSA, mechanical CUSAs with maybe, with maybe coagulation. Plasma knife with uh, CUSA. So combined instruments, visual, different, different, I mean, difference in visualization, it's going to change neurosurgery forever. So gone are the times, these primitive times are going to go and then we will not have to sit and uh, fight on these things. We will have to sit and fight on many different things. So neurosurgery is going to change and it's really exciting times ahead, you see. Okay. And uh, actually, it's, uh, I would like to thank uh, I've served from the Dr. Pragash, Dr. Professor Luis Borba and all the delegates and above all Dr. John Bennett for arranging this wonderful webinar. There's so much of information. And I would like to also place a request to Dr. Ipchen that we must publish this work in the Ignite Journal sometime if possible. The we, are region. we are doing it, we are doing it, for sure. And probably I should it. also congratulate Dr. Voralax because a lot of comments in the chat section, how did Voralax do this illustration? So a special mention, a special thanks to her too. And, yeah, she's and amazing. don't forget, don't forget the next Sunday, the same same time we are having cavernous sinus. And the speakers are Juan Fernandez Miranda, Louis Borba, and Ait Charian. So please don't miss that. And on 6th September, we are having Peter's Apex, endoscopic and open. Paul Gardner, Louis Borba, and Ait Charian. So please note down all these dates on your calendar and don't forget to attend all these webinars. So thank you once again, sir. Thank you. Hey, thanks, and everybody, for coming, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Vinod, Prakash. Thank, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.